Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Tom. Well, Son of Saul is quite an intense movie. Um, uh, and um, as Jen mentioned, it deals with the Saunders Commando. Um, let's talk. Let's begin by talking about who they were, what a Sunder Commando is, and uh, why there's so little information about them, and the extent to which it's controversial. Um, first, I just want to say thank you very much for the invitation to to speak and be a part of the series and to be a part of this event with the LA Holocaust Museum. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to talk about a movie that I think is is very important in the panoply of, of films about the Holocaust. So, so to answer your question, the Sonderkommando, Sonderkommando in German, Sonder means special, Kommando is, is commando, um, which designated the fact that it was a group of prisoners who were specially detailed to shepherd um, other people in the extermination camps, primarily Treblinka and um, Auschwitz-Birkenau, so Birkenau being the one that we all think of, um, to shepherd them through the process from arrival, um, through getting them ready to enter the gas chamber, and then ultimately, as we saw in the film, to um, dispose of their bodies and their ashes. Um, while people were being gassed, which they obviously could hear, they would collect people's belongings, searching through them for valuables or other other items um, that could be reused, including clothing. Um, and then they would also have to to clean out the um the the gas chambers after after people were were murdered. So uh, I'm uh, uh, familiar with the Sonder Commando from uh, the research I did on Treblinka and the, the survivors, including uh, death camp survivors of Treblinka that I actually met and interviewed. Um, uh, in most cases, um, the people who worked as Sonder Commando did so because they hoped to live a little longer, but they knew that eventually they too would be murdered. Um, and very few of them survived, um, which is why we know so little um, about them. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention also that um, in the years following the sort of uh, discovery of the death camps, and what went on there, which only emerged over time, yeah. um, there were there were and there continue to be to these day, uh, both Holocaust deniers and um, anti Semites who um, would like to characterize the Sonder Commando as being no better than the Nazis or as being in some ways collaborators with the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, really important to stress how different they were in the position they were in. Uh, yeah, I agree with you there. Um, you know, the people who worked in the Sonder Commando were usually chosen when they arrived. Um, some of the accounts that we do have from people who survived the Sonder Commando um, have said that basically what they were looking for is people who were physically fit and who would be able to help. Um, in most cases, they were Jews uh, who who were chosen for, for this duty. They were kept separate from an, other parts of the camp. They were they were known as the Geheimnisträger, the keeper of secrets because of the job that they had to do. And, you know, they were given better rations. They had better accommodations but as you as you intimated there wasn't really any choice there and i think one thing that's important to to mention here too is there's some very re recent research that came out by um historian Igor Bartosik um in i think it was in 2022 that the Auschwitz museum itself published that debunked 
correct, or I would say um, complicated the myth of the Sonderkommando being effectively executed every few months. Um, there was one instance where this happened, but it didn't. Um, there's, I can't remember the, the gentleman's name who survived, but there was one, one person who was in the Sonderkommando for three years and survived, actually survived the war and came to the United States after the war. So they did tend to live a little longer, but there were absolutely very few survivors of, of this. Um, I can point if anybody is interested. Um, one of the people who survived it was named Dario Gabai. He was half Italian, half Greek. And we actually have his testimony at the USC Shell Foundation. So that would be something that if people were interested, they could they could watch um, and learn a little bit more about his experiences in the camp. But yeah, you are absolutely right. We know very, very little. Um, I think the number is only about 200 total survived and not that many actually gave testimony. Yeah. And, uh, but we have this movie, Son of Saul, um, which is really, um, you know, it, it won the Academy Award. And I think uh, one of the reasons um, was that it was so striking um, because of the point of view of the way it really, unlike prior films about the Holocaust, um, kind of puts you in the middle of what's going on, either uh, photographing uh, right over the, his shoulder or right to his face. And uh, in some ways, there's a uh, intimacy to that that I think that for me, at least, uh, mirrors reading a Holocaust a survivor testimony where they, particularly the testimony uh, right after the war, when they're speaking of their personal experience um, in the camps and in the death camp. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean, I agree with you there. I think that that um, Nemish also takes a really interesting view. So this isn't the first film that actually deals with Capos. We had Yolo um, Ponte Carvo's 1960 film. Capo. Um, Capo, yeah. Yeah. Um, with the in inimitable Emmanuel Riva in it um that he he actually got a lot of criticism for so that's one of the first ones and then of course there's tim blake nelson's 2001 the gray zone which plays on primo levy's um the drowned and the saved but those don't have they don't take a, a phenomenological approach in the same way that nemesh does in son of saul which i think is very unique um because it shows there's an individualization there that isn't typical of a lot of the, for lack of a better term, more universal narratives that we tend to see. So that's why, you know, a lot of what's going on on the periphery is is blurred out. So you really, in that sense, kind of inhabit the world that Saul is in um, and you're experiencing it that way. And I think that having that parallel, like you said, with witness testimony is, is really important. Um, you know, testimony, testimony really obviously took off after, after Steven Spielberg made, made Schindler's List and the USC Shoah Foundation, you know, we're celebrating our 30th year this year, um, was established. And we learned so much more through witness testimony, it gives us a much more granular reckoning of, of the Holocaust and how the Holocaust happened and individual experiences of the Holocaust that also inform larger narratives about different different groups. It was like before the war and after the war. And... Yeah, yeah. And also just the, I think one of the, one of the, really striking thing. So I, I, I've taught this movie, I rewatched it. And every time I rewatch it, there's always something new that strikes me. And one of the things this time when I was watching it, I was like, you really get a sense of the, the, the sheer chaos that's going that's around. That's exactly what I was going to bring up next. That was, I was also struck by that. 
is that, you know, we think of the German order and everyone has to be, you know, and the, uh, the German, the uh, roll calls and the appels and all that. Mm -hmm. But what Son of Saul really shows us is, is this chaos and how, how people negotiated it and could move. I know that in survivor testimonies that I read from Treblinka, you know, they uh, they would talk about how one of the one of the survivors talked about how he found a spot where he could hide for a few seconds every day to get let him, you know, get his strength back and how he would work with another guy and say, OK, let's slow down just a little bit so we can then go over there. And I think I think this film really, you know, Saul moves around through all these different parts and these different brigades. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, the, the, when I rewatched it recently, I was much more conscious of his ability to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I, I don't necessarily think would have been typical. I mean, yes, there, there, there is order on some level in the camps, but underneath that, that patina of order, there is a lot of chaos and a lot of movement. And I think the other thing that this movie does so well is, is highlight exactly these gray zones to, to steal from, from Prima Levy, these gray zones of operation that people had when they were in the camps. And I also, I mean, this is a, in that sense, it's a very gendered view of it as well, because we, I mean, we only, we see Ella Freed as the, as the, you know, the one woman and he goes to, to Canada, which is the, the effects room to pick up the gunpowder from her. And, um, but, you know, there's, the, the historian Marion Kaplan has written, and there are a lot of other people who have written about this as well, um, about how women tended to band together much more closely to help one another. And I think you also see that gendered experience in this movie as well. Um, so. Yeah. And also, you know, in this hell um, where... Um, morality either doesn't exist or has been turned inside out you know what um what the director does which really um others have shied away from is show the conflicts mm -hmm. the way um people uh, didn't want to help each other or took advantage of each other or pushed their own agenda or priorities mm -hmm. in the fight for survival and we see that um at, at many points in this story and it's um in a way it 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 makes it to me even more credible yeah i mean i think that these moments of moral ambiguity that we see throughout the film um he has a Saul has a conversation with somebody who I, I can't remember which character it was, but he's the character looks at him and says, you failed the living for the dead. And it really brings up these questions about choice. And in situations like this, what does right mean? Um, I, I, you know, I, I keep thinking about there's a there's a book by um a man named Eugen Kogon called The Theory and Practice of Hell. And it's all about his time in a concentration camp. And, it, you know, this, this kind of leans into these concepts of the theories and practices of, of hell. Um, you know, I think the other thing here, and, and, and the director brought this up in his speech when he won the Academy Award is, is, you know, the story of Saul in many ways indicates that there might be some morality and I would argue even some humanity in these situations of where, you know, I think it's, 
I think it's easy to look back and see these as very black and white decisions for people when in fact they're not. And this is something that witness testimonies and, you know, when so many archives in the former Soviet Union opened up after, after the fall, after the fall of the wall, you know, gave us a much better understanding of, of these gray zones and, and the choices that people were forced to make. Definitely. And what's different about the Sunder Commando versus the people who were in the um, other parts of the camp is the pace and the pressure they were on to get to do what they had to do. You know, uh, um, Imre Kertesz, in his account of being a 14 year old boy at uh, Auschwitz, Fateless, um, he talks about the boredom. The, the tiredness and the boredom. But, you know, in Son of Saul, it's just at a furious pace the whole time. And um, that, that also makes the film all that more uh, dynamic. And you mentioned Canada. And so I think it's worth mentioning that although um, the... Film never identifies really where it's taking place. Mm -hmm. There's reason to believe that it's uh, Auschwitz Birkenau because of Canada, because of the mention of Canada, which is with a K, not a C. Yeah. And um, and there was a revolt of the Sonder Commando there on October seventh, nineteen forty four, which um, which happened and involved the women who were working there providing gunpowder. So those facts are things that happened. And the other piece of it that that indicates that this is Auschwitz-Birkenau is the photographer, because in August of 1944, there were four photographs taken, four clandestine photographs taken by a member of the Sonderkommando who's generally identified as a as a Greek um, member of the Sonderkommando named Alex or Alex, um, that were were smuggled out of the camp. So that was that was August, and then obviously at that time they were planning planning the uprising. And of course, the other tip off is that he's speaking Hungarian, and Auschwitz is the greatest cemetery of the Hungarian Jewish people where more than 600,000 were murdered. So, yeah. well, and this, this also, you know, the, the, the photographs, one of the photographs is of Hungarian women, um, being, yeah. being led into the gas chambers, but so that was August and then October is the uprising and, um, the Hungarian Jews were deported to Auschwitz immediately before that. I believe that the last, the last, um, transport came in either late June or early July of 1944. Yeah. Now you have taught this film uh, and I wonder share with us a little bit how your how your students have reacted and or the ways in which you um, approach this film with them. Um, I approach it, I don't give them that much information going in because I want to know what their reactions are without any real input from me. Um, I don't, I don't always teach with a lot of films, but I, I do like this one because it gives them a, an individual perspective. Um, I mean, we're now in a generation when students don't know a, necessarily a lot of the Holocaust films. Like if you ask them what Schindler's List is, they, they may not necessarily know what Schindler's List is. I, you know, I guess it depends. I, I've taught this in a bunch of different university contexts. Um, so I don't really give them too much intro other than to say, you know, this is, this is the movie we're going to watch this week. Please take notes on it. I do ask them, I, I have journal entries that I require my students to write over the course of the semester. Um, and they can pick and choose, but I do ask them specifically to write about this one because I want to read them. And then we actually discuss it. And they're, um, There, a lot of them are very, very shocked by how kind of in depth and personal this is, and it raises, 
in them a lot of the same questions that we're having about moral ambiguity and choice. And, um, you know, a lot of them will say, well, I would never do that. I would never do that. And it's like, well, no. it's really easy to look back, look back and make, make that judgment. But if you're put in that situation, you, you, you really can't know what you're, you're going, you're going to do. Um, but yeah, the, the, the reactions that they, they have with me are, you know, they, they're of course shocked by the film and, and how, what's the word? Um, Visceral. yeah, it is. Um, but they, you know, we, they write their journals. I read their journals. They come to class and then, and then, you know, we, we talk about it and a lot of them have really interesting insights about, well, you know, I, I think he's, he's maybe, you know, maybe he's hallucinating this whole thing and um, maybe it really was his son, you know, maybe he, maybe he managed to escape into the woods and, you know. Um, and of course it's worth saying that they are actually the same age as the Sunder Commando. Yes. <laughs> yes. More, um, you we're know. often, yes, we're often teenagers or, you know, in their tw younger, early 20s. Younger people who were more, yeah. more, more physically, physically fit. Yeah, exactly. So they, they, they were, um, you know, I, and I, one of the things I, I really like to do when I teach is um, have an open dialogue with my students about what I, what I assign because I, you know, you, you don't want to assign readings from semester to semester that people don't like. And I, you know, I ask with this film too, um, do you think that this is something that when I teach this next time that, that I should show? And uh, I, I've never had anybody say no. They, mm -hmm. they say they get a lot out of the, out of the film. And I think, you know, usually what I tend to do with these types of, um, when I teach is, you know, in addition to readings or movies, like I'll give them excerpts from a testimony to watch that goes along with it. So then they have, you know, they have the, the artistic depiction of it through the film, and then they have some testimony that goes along with it. And then they have a written document of some sort that goes along with it as well. And that's a very powerful way to, to get students thinking about some of these, some of these issues as well as combining, combining these various mediums into. Yeah. Well, into the it. title of the film, Son of Saul, mm -hmm. um, uh, refers both to the uh, way in which um, in Hebrew people are named mm -hmm. so-and-so, son of so-and-so, mm -hmm. And um, also to the um, sort of um, narrative mission of the main character with, where he wants to give a proper burial to a, uh, a youth who he believes or says is his son. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Although we hear that he has no son at one point. Yeah. And we don't know if that's literal or metaphorical or protective. And what did you make what do you make of all that? You know, it's such a hard question because when, you know, towards the end of the movie, when um he's asked, like, what is this boy? And he's like, Well, it's my illegitimate son. And he kind of puts his head down when he's then asked, like, when was the last time you saw him? Um, you know, it, it, he doesn't say it's his illegitimate son. He said, it's not the son of my wife. So, I mean, the indication there is that, you know, this is a child that's been born extramaritally. Um, and so to me, I thought of it two different ways. Like maybe he didn't have a son, but maybe because children born of affairs or extramaritally were not often recognized by the state as that, you know, like the child would have been registered with its mother. It would have had its mother's name. Um, that maybe that was, that was what it was. Um, that's hard to tell, but to me, honestly, does it, does it matter? This, this man in this absolutely desperate situation 
connects with this this boy who survives. I mean, and and there is one, there is one case of somebody who did survive the gas chamber. Um, there was a Sondra Commando. Um, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now, who admitted he was a collaborator um, and tried to hide a girl. Um, but he connects with this boy and through this boy, he discovers that amid all of the horrors, there is still some humanity in here. And again, you know, the director kind of says that or said that when he picks up the Oscar. Um, so, you know, to me, does it really matter if it's his son? I, I don't, I don't think it does. And, you know, to me, one of the things that resonated was this notion that in this, in this nightmare hell, he wants to do something right. He wants to do something good. He has to do it. Just, you know, for his sense of self and sanity and all those reasons. And, and weirdly or strangely enough, because it's such a chaotic place, he stands a chance of actually accomplishing this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, um, and that I think speaks a lot to, um, to this, to the, to the Holocaust survivors mm -hmm. and to their, you know, uh, drive to survive mm -hmm. and, uh, and to the very productive lives that many of them had following the war. Um, uh, this also brings us to um, the one of the other mysteries of the movie, which have to do with the final scenes. The right. young boy and uh, Saul's smile, and then the uh, shots we hear uh, while looking at the forest. And what are your thoughts about that? Maybe it's the eternal optimist in me, but we do know that in the uprising, there were some people who were able to escape into the forest and survive the war. Some of them came to the United States after the war. So there's the part of me that wants to think that maybe they were able to fight back in some way and escape. Of course, the reality is probably, probably that that, that their lives were ended there, but there's enough, you know, I mean, the, the little boy who's just witnessed this, you know, is let go and runs off into the forest and, um, he's free, but, um, I like to tell myself that some of them were able to get away and, and meet the, the Polish home, home army. And Saul's smile, looking at the boy, I I think validates his mission. Yeah. In, in yeah. some in some way, yeah. um, I think in in that little boy, even though it's entirely possible that that little boy denounced him, led <laughs> led the SS to the shed. Um, yeah. You know, to me, the smile said that it was was maybe emblematic of the child's spirit that that Saul worked so so hard to give a, a proper Jewish burial um, with Kaddish, but that you know he's at peace with you know I mean, of course he he lost the boy's body in the Vistula River, but he 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 did save the the boy from being autopsied yeah and 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 for for the being put on the spit and incinerated yep which is yep. would have been his fate regardless yep. um um so in a second we'll open it up to questions we have some questions uh, in the Q and A. If anyone else has some others, please share them. Um, 
uh, and uh, but sort of as a last question, um, I thought about how um, how the power of a film such as this to really um, remind people of truths that we'd like to think are behind us mm -hmm. and in the past. And this makes them very um, alive and present. Mm -hmm. And I know that's actually sort of the work that you're doing um, at the Shoah Foundation is very much the same to, to remind people that this is not um, ancient history. No. Um, um, and so um, uh, I think it is a film that uh, does not for one second seem dated in any way. No, I agree with you. It doesn't, it doesn't seem dated in any way. And I think that this kind of phenomenological perspective of just just Saul himself is also a really good reminder of why it's important to remember individuals, to preserve their memory, um, be it in text, in document form, or mm -hmm. audiovisually and in, in video testimonies of people, even written testimonies as well. Um, so that we can we can take lessons from those different types of sources to help combat contemporary forms of anti-Semitism and other and racism and xenophobia or other types of identity-based hate. Um, so in that sense, I think that the you know using that perspective is a really, really wonderful metaphor for why individual stories are so important for learning the history, but also understanding why that history is important for us today. Yeah, uh, agreed. Um, uh, so the, one of the questions is, um, do you know whether there were many capos who resisted or who refused work individually um, I, again, what I would say without having to sort of go through all the the literature, um, you know, what I think Son of Saul shows us is that the Capos were even more complex figures mm -hmm. in a very complex situation. And some of them could be a person's savior in many ways, uh, certainly uh, we screened um, last uh, year or, or earlier this year, um, uh, the Simone Vale film mm -hmm. about uh, the French uh, Auschwitz survivor and mm -hmm. uh, famous legislature. And she was very adamant that it was the capo who saved her life mm -hmm. and, and, and had her spared. So um, this opens up the larger question of, of what is resistance? And I think, uh, you know, at the very base, um, any act of survival or breath or existence in the nightmare hell of, uh, of, of a death camp Mm -hmm. is resistance. And so um, it's easy to want to characterize the capos who, some of whom did bad mm -hmm. things, but <laughs> they were only doing bad things because of the situation that they were forced to be in. Yeah, I agree with you on that. And I think, um, you know, I Primo Levi discusses capos and Muslimena in, in his work. Um, and, you know, this concept of resistance is, is really, to me, it's very interesting because I think most people tend to think in very grand terms 
when they right. talk about resistance. So, I mean, as as a consumer of Showtime, um, the movie Valkyrie has been on a, a lot recently. And, you know, that is based on the the July 20th plot against Hitler and, you know, is, is kind of this grand form of resistance. But when you're in a situation like a concentration or an extermination camp, it, you can't necessarily, I mean, yes, we know that the Sonderkommando, there was a revolt in October of 1944, but even in this film, we see that there are small acts of resistance that people are able are able to, to, to do throughout the film. I mean, the fact that Saul is able to take this child's body is, is an act of resistance. Um, finding your humanity in a, in a situation where everything that happens to you is to dehumanize you. That's another act of resistance. Um, you know, the kind of eminently German historian Detlef Poikart has has written about the spectrum of resistance. Now it was applied to the German population, but I think we can use that same principle when we're thinking about choices that people are making in the camp. So yes, capos, they made choices as you know, you mentioned the the famous the famous case of Simone Weil. Um but we see that in the movie. I think we see that in so many of the movies that that people have. And I, I'll come back to to um, Ponte Corvo's 1960 movie Capo, where the character played by Emmanuel Riva commits suicide. Right. And that is also an act of defiance and resistance to what's happening. But there's there are so many ways. Um, I have a very dear colleague whose mother was a survivor and, you know, used to smuggle pieces of bread. And yeah, so I, th I think- the difference between life and death. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, someone asked, since the Sonderkommando knew that they would eventually be killed, why do you think they didn't resist against the Germans sooner? I think, um, you know, I think that's a question that it's easy to ask from our perspective, you know, with hindsight, but the reality of the camp as we see it um, is that um, there was not either the time, the mental space, the coordination, the ability um, to, um, to resist and only really um, either when the pace of the uh, gas chamber slowed a little bit or when the Thunder Commando knew because they were, because the pace was slowing, that they would soon be murdered, were they really able to organize resistance which were on the whole uh, not very successful um, given the numbers who, who uh, survived or were murdered. Um, and, you know, the other thing is that as we see in this film, you know, to, to uh, be able to steal enough gunpowder to make a bomb takes a long time. Now, someone else asked, you know, why did Saul not, you know, why did he um, sort of misplace or misuse the gunpowder? You know, why did he prioritize the burial of the son of Saul over the gunpowder? And, you know, I again, I would say we have such an in, individual purpose here. Yeah. And, you know, selfishness was an act of resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the other thing, too, is, is um, as I said, the, the study by by Igor Bartosik has has shown that, you know, the Capos, the you know, there's there's this kind of longstanding myth that the Sonar Commando would work for three months and then they they would suffer the same fate as the right. people. And as I said, 
but Bartosik has actually shown in in this study from 2022 that that wasn't the case. And you know, there are some of the individual testimonies of of the few people who survived this. Um, you know, I think I mentioned earlier that there was somebody who who was in the Sonar Commando for three years. I, and I can't imagine what that would do to somebody mentally. Um, and I mean, you, you mentioned some of the reasons people couldn't resist. I mean, we also need to keep in mind that while these people might have been fit, they might have had, you know, slightly more rations. They still were physically weaker than the general population. Um, that's That's kind of one piece of this, but also escape didn't necessarily mean that you were running into a population that was friendly and going to help you. You looked right. different, probably had a shaved head. You were in a uniform that clearly indicated that you were in a camp. So, you know, it, it, you couldn't hide as easily as, as I think one might think that you could. Um, certainly not men. No. Men were much more difficult to hide, particularly when there were no more Jews in a village. Um, but um, but uh, I guess I will uh, um, end our conversation with uh, a phrase, something that Pinchas Epstein, who was a survivor of the death camp at Treblinka, said that uh, haunts me <laughs> to this day. He said, um, uh, no one who was in Treblinka will ever get out. And no one who has not been in Treblinka will ever understand, will ever be able to be in there. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Son of Saul's great achievement is that we have an intimation of what it was like to be in there. Yeah, I I agree with you there. I mean, it's you know, as digital technology is mm -hmm. is moving along and you know, we're getting VR experiences um of 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 some of I've actually just recently seen some some very very compelling VR experiences of being in the Woods ghetto for instance, but um this that you're right. This this gives you gives the viewer some idea. Uh, you know, I think not only from Saul's perspective, but also you know when they do focus in on other people with whom he's he's you know engaged, then you know you can see their impression of him as well. So right. it, it really, this is such a fantastic focus on the individual here um and you know yes we can call Saul selfish for you know putting himself above the collective but well but the the Nazis program was to make people no longer be individuals right they gave you a number they dressed you like everyone else they you know et cetera et cetera so well listen Jennifer I want to thank you so much for this conversation um Really terrific. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. And thank you to you two for the wonderful conversation and to Jen and Shelby and you for the invitation. Um, I was really, really happy to, to be able to have this conversation with you. Thank you. And I want to thank all our viewers. Um, as Jen mentioned at the beginning, we have more films in person on Thursdays at the AMC at the Grove. Uh, please go on to the Holocaust Museum's website, hmla.org, and you'll be able to RSVP for the films. Uh, one of them, I one or, one or two of them are uh, sort of uh, uh, premieres, so I think that'll be kind of, or new films at the very least. So I think those will be fascinating. And, um, and again, uh, we want to thank all our, we want to thank the museum, thank Beth Keen, Thank Jen Maxey. Thank Shelby um, uh, for their incredible work helping to do this. And um, thank the people who have funded this uh, 
Holocaust film series, uh, the Greenland Foundation, the Nazarian Foundation, the Richenthal Foundation, the Davidson Hooker Fund. And um, if all of you like what we're doing, uh, please feel free to contribute. Uh, there's a donate button on the website. Uh, no donation is too small and no donation is too large. So thank you and good night. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks a lot, Tom. Take care.